Welcome to Autism Weekly, a podcast that discusses autism news, current events, and inclusion. Each week, we welcome a guest to the program to share their unique perspective and expertise as it relates to the fascinating world of autism. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. I'm the founder and president at ABS Kids. I've been in the field of autism and applied behavior analysis as a clinician and advocate for nearly two decades. This week, we welcome Dr. Matt Broadhead to the podcast to talk with us about the importance of matching patient needs with providers. We'll talk about the broadness of ABA, yet the specificity of care. Every child with autism is so different, and each provider needs to think critically about the care that they are providing. Dr. Broadhead is an associate professor at Michigan State University and the research director of Michigan State University's Early Learning Institute. Dr. Broadhead has published over 40 peer-reviewed research articles on autism and behavior analysis. He's also the author of a workbook in behavior system analysis and ethical behavior, as well as practical ethics for effective treatment of autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Broadhead, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, and I look forward to talking with you today. No, and I appreciate it. Um, One thing that I'd love to be able to get a good understanding is, is that people who enter the field of autism... Um, typically have a passion for it. It's a service industry. It's, it's something where we're driven to be there. What made you fall in love with autism or with the field of ABA in general? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. And, um, you know, certainly did enter this with a passion, though it came as, as a bit of a surprise. I was a psychology major at West, Western Michigan University and as an undergrad, I had to do a practicum and I didn't know what a practicum was. And I had put off signing up for one until it was too late. I could only sign up for, for one without having to submit a formal application. And so that was an autism practicum at Croydon Avenue schools. So I showed up the first day, not really knowing what it was. And I got placed to work with um, a young man about uh, two or three years old. And it was over the course of that semester where I was taught to use behavioral principles to teach him how to uh, better speak, play, um, interact with their friends. And that semester was really transformative to me. It, it, It was so much fun, so enlightening, and really inspired me uh, to pursue this as, um, you know, my, my, my goal in life is to, is to support people with autism and, and learn as much about the science of uh, behavior analysis as I could. I would imagine is that just even that connection that you form with the child probably helped to inform moving more into the practical ethics side of applied behavior analysis and understanding that each decision that you make is so impactful to the individual child and that you could be a part of something great or subsequently is that you could be entering into something that you could create harm. How did your interest in practical ethics come about and where do you see that within ABA? Yeah, I had the, you know, tremendous opportunity. You know, it turned out that Western Michigan University was a, was a hotbed for, um, you know, coursework in behavior analysis. And, and I just stumbled upon that by accident. But I was lucky to take courses from people who were, you know, renowned experts in this area. And it was something that they incorporated into their lectures all the time, whether or not it was a course on ethics or not. Ethics was always a point of conversation. So it just, to me, the the idea of providing autism treatment or behavioral intervention and doing it in an ethical way just became interwoven with one another and so much so to where i really don't think you can have one without the other and and they just um for me they're just one of the same and and um help guide you know the types of decisions that i make as a as a researcher or, or a teacher and also how i go about mentoring and advising my own students I think that's such an important role that you're playing because when I look at the history of applied behavior analysis as it relates to autism, the field itself is is so deep. It's so broad. 
It's we are touching so many parts of a child's development or an adult's development and the lives of those around them. So when you're talking about scope of competence within ethics, tell me what that what that feels like 20 years ago or 15 years ago when we didn't have the provider base compared to now. What where did this start that scope of competence issue? Sure, I think that so you know when thinking about scope of competence and 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 what that means um it's it's defined as the the things that we're able to do to a certain level of acceptability or proficiency. And back, you know, even maybe 10 or 20 years ago, you know, let's say 20 years ago and and, and before then, people were training behavior analysts to be sort of jacks of all trades and and to do all sorts of different things with various types of populations, autism maybe being one. But as awareness increased and the availability of funding increased, so did uh, the 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 focus that university training programs and, and supervisory programs to help to further hone in on the skills that are necessary to support individuals with autism. So to sort of move from this sort of general ability to provide behavioral interventions to a, a very specific set of skills to more optimally uh, in um, more effectively support um, people um, with autism. So it's, it's similar to what we saw in medicine where general practitioners might have been kind of the, the base of care, but now we have all these specialists. We have people that can focus. And what is what are some of these areas where you're seeing a more specific influence within applied behavior analysis being applied to patients? Yeah, I see, you know, one of, one of the things that I get really excited about, and though I'm not an expert in this area, but I think it always use as, it works as a, you know, a good, um, you know, point of discussion is in the area of treating challenging behavior. That's such a specialized focus and area of expertise that people go to graduate programs to become really, really good at supporting individuals who you know display challenging behavior, aggressive behavior, or or self injury. Now, another area being in early intervention and skill acquisition, which is the area that I was trained clinically in. And also in the area of school-based interventions for students with autism um, as well, adolescents with autism, um, and then as uh, thinking about how we can support individuals individuals with autism as they age, you also see specialty areas of research and practice developing in those domains as well. And there are many others uh, that certainly exist, but just to sort of name a few to... Um, compartmentalize uh, what different types of descriptions of expertise might might look like. And I would just hearing some of these areas is that some sound like they could be if you don't have the right skill set, if you don't have the right competency, you have the opportunity to create some real harm. But whether it's the severe aggression or self injury or um, one that's that's probably not that researched where we need more practitioners is sexualized behaviors. Do you have any examples of you know patients that really needed that level of care where maybe the family needed to find the specialist or the behavior analyst needed the consult? Uh, can you paint this picture for us? Yeah, that's a really qu- great question. And in fact, I, I do have an example. Um, I do remember when I was consulting one time, I was doing an independent evaluation and I went into a autism center and there was an individual who was engaging in severe aggression to be able to get access to a, just a quiet space at that center where they would engage in self-stimulatory behavior. So they would um, engage in you know what we call, you know, s- sexual behavior uh, in, to promote some form of, of stimulation of their body. And after talking with the individuals who were assigned to support this the, this person, 
they had informed me that they really hadn't done the assessments that I felt that they needed to do. And they hadn't reached out to anybody who specialized in, in sexual education or in, in um, you know, maybe quote unquote, inappropriate sexual behaviors of individuals with developmental disabilities. And, you know, that to me was, was concerning. And, you know, what could have happened in that case, the reaching out to individuals who have the skills to support those types of behaviors really could have gone a long way in supporting this individual's challenging behavior because there was not any learning that was getting done. It was, it was simply just sort of behavior management and nothing more. Um, you know, you talk about harm, you have this harm that manifests itself, you know, uh, with regard to lost time and um, people also may perceive behavioral interventions as being ineffective, which which we know uh, is not the case. Behavioral interventions are very effective. It's just that they have been um, misapplied. And so when people get the idea that behavioral interventions are ineffective, it leads them to support or look at other types of treatments for autism that are not effective, that could be more costly or, or maybe physically harmful, um, which again, is just more harm that is caused by um, acting outside of your own um, competencies. And I, I think that, Matt, uh, that I've seen this before, is that I've seen where somebody with severe aggressive behavior or self-injurious behavior didn't get that specialty care and had somebody that it was in their best interest. They were trying, but they didn't really understand the influence that they could have within their treatment planning, and it led to hospitalization. Um, but this this is a nuance for me. It's it's understanding is that you're we're a part of a growing field, and some of the maturity that exists is understanding what you don't know. So, how do practitioners? understand their level of competence and how do families advocate for, you know, I need to know that I have the right practitioner for this particular severe behavior. Yeah, that's a, you know, a really great question. And, and, um, you know, to get at the practitioner question first, there, the, the role or the responsibility for identifying one's scope of competence falls on each and every single practitioner. There's no body that I'm aware of that that points officially to what certain people are good at. So it's up to all of us to know our own strengths and weaknesses. So it requires a level of self-awareness and uh, constant reflection and humility to be able to understand that. And it also requires organizational support to allow you know, you know, professionals to say, hey, I might need more development in this area. Can we get some help? And for the organization to uh, support that either through supervision internally or professional development, external supervision, whatever it might be, so that professional can get the help that they need to be able to support the individual that they're trying to support. Now, for consumers, a really great question would be to ask or to start with by asking, you know, what has been your success in treating similar cases like the one for, for my child or the, the child that I'm um, in charge of supervising or might be the guardian for? And so the practitioner should be able to articulate what their you know, previous level of success has been. Other questions that they may ask are what professional development or supervisory resources are available to you in the event that you need more help to support you know, our, our child. And so the practitioner should be able to articulate, you know, these are the things that our organization might do, or I have this professional development money on hand, or we have access to external consultants who are experts in these areas and they can come in on an as needed basis to support or do whatever it, um, it might take to, um, uh, you know, help us solve these challenges. So those are just a few things that, you know, the consumers might ask, but I think that it's a, a, you know, a really important question just so they make sure that the ch child is, is getting the care that they need. You know, I think about, 
you know, my own kids and I take them to, you know, pediatrician, I'm curious about what their expertise is and in what they can do to be able to support, as you mentioned, you know, it, it's a general, um, the, the treatment has gone from general to, to specific and everyone's specialized in different areas. And we just want to make sure that the match is right. So we don't waste any time. And so we can, um, optimize the time that we do have together. Uh, such great advice. I, I, the worst question is the one that you don't ask and just uh, helping families to really understand that you're not, you're not insulting anybody by asking them about the history of intervention or their history of success or their training. Um, yeah, it, it, I would imagine it's very different for each one of these providers out there is that I, I've been lucky enough to be a part of an organization with thousands of clinicians and hundreds of BCBAs. So finding that network of resources is relatively easy. But I do understand is that finding that resource or finding that continued education for people who might not have su such a network around them can be hard. Where can they turn to get more information on uh, toileting if that's the big issue that their child's working on or on self-injurious behaviors or on uh, pica-like uh, behaviors where a child is putting things constantly in their mouth and, and ingesting things that could be dangerous? Like, how do, how do we build that competence? What are the resources that are available for behavior analysts? Jeff, you know, the one thing that keeps coming to my mind is the infrastructure that has been built as a result of, of COVID. And, you know, I, I, I'm not happy that we had this pandemic and I don't think anybody is, but to be honest, it, it did bring about this infrastructure of remote interaction that we did not have uh, once before. And that comes in the form of telehealth, teleconsultation, and also the number of conferences and customized continuing education activities that are online is just, you know, it's grown exponentially over the last year or so. So when I look at that, I see uh, ample opportunity for practitioners to be able to access expert resources. I also think about all the special interest groups that exist and how those special interest groups in you know, certain areas of, of autism intervention or, or just in behavior analysis in general contain experts who are on the front edge of research and practice in these areas that I know would be more than happy to field questions and point practitioners and into, you know, the right direction about where they can go to get the information that they may need to best help their clients. Yeah, I think that, you know, we all need to feel like we can reach out to one another and be able to use each other as resources. Uh, just reflecting back, I, I think it must have been 12, 13 years ago, but I had a, I had a patient who was visually impaired and um, was also auditorily impaired engaging in high levels of self-injurious behavior. And that's something that, you know, you don't walk into a patient with those needs on a regular basis. So I had to consult with medicine. I had to, so their physician was involved. I had to consult with their psychiatrist to understand how their medicine was, or medication was going to be affecting them. What sort of outside competencies does a behavior analyst also need to understand that, you know, I need to understand enough about these other disciplines if I have a child who's receiving a multitude of, of needs or cares, whether it's medical or f uh, physical or whatever it might be, to build competency. Do you have examples? You know, when I, th when I think about that question, I, I, again, I, I come back to the network of, of people around you. And one, one example in my life that comes to mind, so when the when the pandemic came and, and and hit we started a program where we provided free telehealth support to caregivers of people with autism within the state of michigan and we had cases that would come up every once in a while where we would really be puzzled and you know i have a phd and you know that that on paper grants a lot of um 
authority, but but really there's so much that I, I don't know, but what's important is to understand that you don't know something and to understand where you might go to get the help that you need. So, you know, I would call up friends who were specialists in these areas of, of concern that we were facing and really pick their brain and get their advice on things. And you can bet that they may call me sometimes too and get my advice on on certain issues there as well. And so we have a reciprocal relationship, um, mutually beneficial relationship there to where we can support each other, do it in a confidential way that that obviously respects the um, you know, the rights of, of the clients that we're serving. But you know, again, I, it keeps on, I keep on coming back to this idea of recognition of what you don't know and, and being willing to say, I don't understand and I need to know more and that there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, there's um, so much to be celebrated about that level of humility because by doing that, you are better serving the, the people, um, the clients that, that you've set out to um, serve and, and protect their health and safety. You're, you're painting a wonderful picture of uh, the need for us to really emphasize professional maturity um, and, and having that as part of the training program for clinicians to really understand how to benefit one another, how to be collaborative, how to reach out to be able to utilize that resource. What happens if, if a parent is out there and they don't feel like somebody is acting within their scope of competence and they feel nervous about what's happening with their program. What do you suggest in that situation to a family or to a parent? You know, that's a really great question. And, and I, you know, my first suggestion to a family would be if you, if you feel that something isn't right, trust your gut. And I, those are very valid feelings and they are certainly worth pursuing if, if, if you believe that that is the case. So you might start by asking questions and ensuring, um, you know, Hey, is this something that we might be trained to do? Do you have any support that you might have to be able to access and, you know, hearing out and, and, um, you know, getting information from the professionals that you might be working with, but also documenting those conversations that you may have as well. Um, you know, hopefully the situation might be remediated and and things get better. But if the professional that you're working with is dismissive um, or they do things that you might think are negligent by documenting that information, um, should the need arise that you need to report them to the credentialing body or licensing board, um, then you would have that information. Now, I'm not suggesting that, um, you know, the, 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 the sense or, or hint of, of something happening is, is grounds to report somebody, but this is about protecting, um, you know, the, 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 the client and, and the parent doing the due diligence to be able to do that. And so, you know, if, if another option is to, you know, look out and see if there might be other providers in the area that might be better suited to be able to support that person. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is, is that that people's needs change. And it could be the case that you start off with one provider and things are going very well and the needs change. And it turns out that that provider just isn't suited anymore to support that person. And they might need to switch to somebody else. And and that's certainly okay. And, and in those cases, I would hope that the providers would be supportive of that and, and recognize that too and, and uh, facilitate a transition that was supportive and um, non-disruptive. I appreciate the way you outlined the parent perspective there because it, it is important that the parents have a voice in treatment. And I, I, and I know that you've worked so much on ethical considerations, and that's probably one of the big ones is you need to have stakeholder involvement in all those decisions and, and helping them to be informed about that process, um, one of which would be your competence. So I, I think that that's so important. I I want to give our listeners the chance to understand what other resources are out there or how they could make sure that they're following ethical decision-making models. Um, 
some of those resources are your own books. So please tell us a little bit about how to get those. But what other resources do you recommend? Sure. So um, I have written a few books. And, and just as um, disclosure, I do receive financial compensation for their sales, just to be transparent. But we wrote uh, a book called Practical Ethics for Effective Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorder. And it is published by Academic Press. And is you can find it on um, you know any major book distributor. Um, I'm not endorsing Amazon by any means, but it is available there. And it's meant to sort of describe some of the core philosophical values that might guide decision making and, and ethics. And we also talk about interdisciplinary collaboration, evidence based practice, and also scope of competence in, in that book. And though, you know, those might read or sound like, um, you know, high level topics, I mean, they are very important. We, we've written it in a way that we feel is consumable and approachable. And that's the feedback that we've received from our readers. The other book, uh, the workbook that I've written is um, about behavioral systems and ethical behavior. And, and that really is more for the practicing professional who is looking to build strength within their organization to ensure that their employees are doing the right things at the right times. And, and so um, though it might be of interest to a parent, I think more so an interest to a uh, practitioner who might be thinking, hey, I really want to improve ethical behavior in my organization, but I don't know where to start. The workbook is to be able to, is meant to be able to do that. Now, if, if people are still interested in learning more or want to learn more, I um, you really have been impressed with a lot of the um, journal articles that have been published in the journal Behavior Analysis and Practice. There's been a lot of great papers on ethics in behavior analysis in that tech, in that journal, many of which are autism focused. And again, it's, it's, they're written for masters or PhD level professionals, but I think that the journal does a good job of communicating things in an easy to digest manner. And so if parents ever want to look into, into any of that information, they, uh, but they don't want to pay for the journal article, which I certainly do not uh, blame them for. There's information at the bottom of every article page that shows how they can contact the lead author. And I guarantee that you send them an email and ask them for a copy of the article. Uh, they will be more than happy to share it with you. Um, I, I get requests like that from time to time, and I'm just excited that people are interested and I'm always really happy to share, share access to that. Um, the other thing too, is I would certainly, you know, recommend becoming, um, you know, involved in, in parent groups and, and also with the, um, learning more from your local ABA agencies or other autism treatment agencies, what they're doing to support ethical behavior at the local level, because they might have things too that they are doing within their organization or within the community that could be helpful or interesting to those parents there as well. I think that all of those resources sound like very valuable sources. Um, I, I'm actually, as you were talking about the systems-based and the organizational-based ethics, I think that that's one that every clinician should take a look at and really understand. Um, on the clinician level, do you have words of advice for, I mean, it's such a growing field. You have, I mean, RBTs being certified, uh, those are the registered behavior technicians being certified on a, on a just a increasing basis. You have new BCBAs entering into the field and walking into a world where this job is it's something that they have worked hard at, but doing the job is harder than understanding the job, I think, at times. The implementation of it is really challenging. What's your advice for them, for those that are listening to this podcast? You know, my advice would be to, um, you know, you can't solve every problem and tackle everything at one time. And I would, you know, it's always been my experience that to start small and be effective than to go all in and, and be ineffective. And that just sort of might shake your confidence. And so, you know, a, approach supporting 
your RBTs or, or supervisees in the same analytical way that you would support support um, your your clients with autism. Um, use the same commitment to operational definitions, data collection, data analysis, um, program revision for your employees as you would um, for your clients. And again, interventions with our clients need revision and, and change and constant attention. And they also do for our employees. And so just to you know, maintain care to those ideas and um, and also awareness of what your um, time allows you to be able to do. Um, you have an entire career to, to save the world. Um, and it is certainly, um, you know, not a sprint. It, it's a, it's a, it's a marathon, so to speak. Um, so, you know, take it easy and, uh, but take it. I hope all the clinicians heed that advice. I, and I appreciate Dr. Brett and you taking some time to chat with us today. The lens that you look at, uh, and, and how you clarify how that is immediately put into practice. I think it's an important lens for us all to share. And um, and just the way that you were able to articulate it, hopefully that gets people thinking about each decision they make. So I appreciate you coming on the podcast today. No, I appreciate you having me. And, you know, I, I love this field and I love the science and I love working with all the kids and families. You know, the kids and families have taught me so much um, about what it means to be a behavior analyst, a, you know, a, a teacher, um, a researcher. And um just grateful to be able to play a part in something that's so meaningful and so exciting. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.